On Tech News Today, France is going to ban Uber, Sony Pictures is going to sue the media, and Xiaomi forgets to copy Apple's profitability. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and if you'd like to help us design our new website, I invite you to visit twit.to slash navtest. We've got eight quick questions we'd like to ask you that will help us make the navigation easier to use. That's twit.to slash navtest. Thanks a lot. This is Tech News Today from Monday, December 15th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll have many more happy holidays as you grow and protect your wealth with this award-winning financial app. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. And by Braintree. If you're a developer or manager of a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out Braintree. Braintree's new V.0 SDK makes it easy to support multiple mobile payment types with one simple integration. To learn more and to try out their sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash twit. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin, and with us today, as always, is Jason Cleanthes. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing pretty good, Mike. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. You know, I probably shouldn't say good morning because it's morning here in California, but it's not morning in other places around the world. For example, it's the afternoon in the East Coast. It's the evening in Europe. So I should just say, hey, how's it going? Something there you like go. that. There you so, go. We'll try to remember that in the future. And we have Lindsay Turrentine as our co-anchor. How you doing, Lindsay? I'm doing great. I'm ready. You're ready for what? News? For everything. All everything. Right. Wonderful. Well, we've got a. We uh, we were talking before the show began about how I've been trying to not over cover cover Uber because Uber is constantly in the news for this controversy or that controversy, and they're really it's not a super techy kind of a story because as a company, yeah, they have an app. The app is kind of cool. They have a few algorithms, uh, but mostly it's a ride sharing service. And so I've been kind of tr trying to avoid covering them to a certain extent. But it's just you have to cover them. So why don't we launch in to the news and cover Uber? Um, they made us do it. What are we going to do? The French government said today that they would ban Uber starting January 1st. The announcement comes as Paris taxi drivers protest Uber by blocking major roads and creating traffic jams in and around Paris. Sam Schechner is a Paris-based tech correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, and he joins us to talk about this. Hey, Sam, how are you doing? Hi. Now, how bad are the traffic jams today, and what is an escargot operation? It sounds delicious. Uh, well, it's uh, not so delicious if you're trying to get to the airport on time. Uh, the traffic jams, judging you know by the the cameras, I you know I I took a metro to work today, so I, I didn't have to <laughs> deal with it personally. Uh, but they looked pretty bad on the ring road around Paris uh, and some of the on ramps there, and on the highways to uh, and from the airports. Uh, what an escargot operation is is. Uh, Basically, taxis block the roads by driving at a snail's pace, about five five miles an hour, and uh, you know it, it, it certainly interrupts the, uh, the the flow of traffic. It's not necessarily 100% legal, but there's not much uh, cops can do about it because there's a lot of taxis. So, uh, I, I I have a question about this ban. Was it going to happen anyway, or is it a result of the protests? And then also, what's the difference between Uber and Uber Pop? And Uber Pop is what's being banned in January, is that right? Bingo, I was about to say that. Uber <laughs> is not gonna be banned in France. Uh, there's actually, Uber is one of a number of apps that you can use to order uh, car services that aren't taxis in France, which have themselves been controversial because the taxis hate them. Uh, but they're, they weren't gonna be banned. What is, uh, what the French government has said that they think will be banned uh, as of January 1st is Uber Pop which is sometimes uh, in the U.S. it's often known as Uber X. Uh, it's where there's drivers without professional licenses doing the driving. Um, that is, according to the government, illegal. Uh, and so they, there is a new law that was passed in France this fall, uh, which has a whole lot of you know, interesting, uh, interesting propositions in it, one of which would ban uh, companies like Uber from using uh, the, the pretty maps showing where vehicles are nearby. Uh, in in their app, or at least they couldn't show the nearby vehicles. Um, 
But one of the other things it says is that if you don't have a license, you can't uh, take paying customers to drive people around places. Um, and so the government believes that that provision in the law will give them the power to ban Uber Pop. Uber disagrees. Uber says that uh, they'll see them in court if they try to ban it. So it'll be an interesting beginning of next year. Now, the law that you're referencing, I believe, is called the Tevenu Law. Is that, am I saying that well, right? You are. It, funny story about that. It's named after a lawmaker named Tevenu. Uh, they frequently do that. The person who kind of carries the law in France gets the name. He has since been tossed out of office because he uh, allegedly never paid his taxes. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a pretty ironic thing. But everyone still calls it the Tevenu Law. Anyway, oh. yes, that is the law. Okay, so it, it sounds to me kind of bizarre that the thing they would ban would be the showing of the real-time location of drivers on a map. How is it that they can ban something like that? Is that, I mean, I, I just don't understand why that's well, the thing they would ban. All right. I mean, you can put yourself, you can say it's good or bad, but the, the logic of it is is this. The, the law came after a lot of protests from taxi drivers. They didn't like all of the competition coming from these new apps. Um, you know, you could say they're rent seeking. You could say that the new apps aren't following rules. We can leave that to, to other commentators. But uh, following that, the idea of the law was to keep certain things as a monopoly for taxis and open up the competition to everyone else. And that idea, what ta although only, only taxis in France are allowed to accept street hails, um, you know, stop on the street, not no planning. You can just get into a car. Otherwise, you have to call and reserve or order or something like that. So it was judged by Mr. Tevenu uh, a little bit too much like a street hail to be able to see the cars nearby and pick one to, uh, to call. So the idea is that Uber could still use all the same technology, but it, you couldn't, it couldn't have that pretty map. Uh, and, and some people did think that that was a sort of silly, silly rule, but that was, the, uh, that was the idea behind it. It's not the only element of this law. Another element of the law that's perhaps even more controversial is this idea of the return to garage. Uh, in, under French law, only taxis are supposed to be allowed to kind of drive around aimlessly without a fare if they don't have a reservation. So the law says that you either, if you don't have a fare and you're not a taxi, i.e. you're Uber or one of these other companies, that you have to either, you know, have a reservation or be on your way back to your garage, um, which obviously would interfere a little bit with the pretty operation of this map where you see the cars circling around. By the way, there are Uber pop cars like currently in the streets of Paris. So, <laughs> you know, hasn't hasn't uh, thwarted the drivers just yet. Moving moving slowly, I imagine, because of the escargot thing. <laughs> well, the escargot, I think uh, people, the, the, the snails cleared the roads earlier today. So I think traffic's more or less back to normal, which is already kind of a crawl in Paris most of the time. So, Sam, do you think that all of Uber's PR crises is making it easier for the French government to respond to protests and, and sort of say, OK, sure, we'll do what you want? Do you think it would be a little bit harder if Uber weren't already in so much PR trouble or or do French leaders don't, not care? No, I think it definitely does make it easier. I mean, to be fair to the French leaders in the context of who's banning Uber when, they actually are a little bit late to the party. I mean, there are plenty of cities in the U.S. that have said Uber pops illegal, letters, angry letters sent from, you know, uh, mayors and things like that. Uh, Spain, last week alone, Amsterdam, uh, Spain said that they were going to at least temporarily ban it. Uh, a Brussels city manager has stepped in and now wants to figure out ways to ban it. So the French are kind of joining a, a broader a broader array of, of fights. When it comes to the taxis, I mean, I think taxis are definitely forcing their hand. There wouldn't have been a law Tevenu if there weren't taxis fighting against these companies. There was already a legal framework in which these guys were operating. The license was a lot cheaper and the taxis said it was unfair and said that they were driving around and kind of impeding the taxis business. And they were already striking frequently. And, and that was in part why the law was brought into effect to try and balance it without getting rid of Uber and its friends, but to try and, as they put it, you know, create a balance in the marketplace. Uh, the taxis haven't been totally happy with the law. In fact, it, it requires them to have credit card readers. There's other things that are requirements on taxis that they don't like. So they've continued to protest. Sam Schechner is at WSJ.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Sam Schechner. Thanks for joining us, Sam. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, if you have an opinion about this whole issue, in a nutshell, you know, uh, Uber is disruptive. They want to disrupt the taxi industry, essentially. And on the one hand, we should allow innovation. But on the other hand, why should innovative companies get uh, to play under rules that uh, the taxis don't have to, 
to play under. Let us know what you think. TNT at twit.tv. Uh, we're really curious to hear whether you're in favor or against banning Uber. Well, in just a minute, we're going to talk about a uh, really interesting interview that took place uh, with a notorious hacker. But first, I want to tell you about personal capital. New Year's Eve is coming, and we all want to make uh, New Year's Eve resolutions. And so here's one for you. Why don't you resolve to really get your financial life in super amazing shape, get organized, save money, and uh, get ahead financially. The way to do that is with personal capital. And the way they help you do that is that they will take all of your financial accounts and put them into one place. You see it all in one view with intuitive graphs and charts that help you get a real understanding of what's happening with your money. And one of my favorite attributes of personal capital is the fact that they will notify you when you're about to be charged fees that you shouldn't be charged or you don't have to be charged. They'll save you a lot of money. They have personally saved me a lot of money by notifying me about uh, fees and charges that uh, that I could uh, avoid by taking action. I took action and I avoided the fees and the app is free. So think about the calculation there. The app is free and they'll save you money. So it's really a fantastic thing to do. Uh, take control of your financial future and make personal capital and getting your financial house in order one of your New Year's resolutions for 2015. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TNT. And remember that Personal Capital is free, and it's a smart way to grow your money. We thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Today. Well, Lindsay, it turns out that hackers have kids too, don't they? They do. Uh, <laughs> this is really interesting that former... Lulsec and very famous hacker named Hector Monsegur, and he was known online as Sabu for many years. He became an informant for the FBI when he was forced to choose between his two adopted children and uh, continuing to work for Anonymous. He, he's given a couple of interviews, one to Charlie Rose and then the next to CNET's Tim Stevens, and he talks in three videos at length about his philosophy, some of his biggest hacks. It's really interesting, partially because we see this kind of very human face of somebody uh, who is part of a really secretive organization or was, and um, he's obviously very controversial because uh, Anonymous and, and others in that community were obviously extremely upset when he decided to help the FBI. So it's a, it's a really interesting set of questions and, and conversation. He's kind of a down to earth guy. Yeah, I was surprised that Tim Stevens didn't open the interview with, so what kind of car do you drive? Because I know <laughs> Tim is a huge car fan and covers mostly autom automobile technology these days for CNET. Uh, great guy, Tim, we love having having him on this show. Now it was kind of interesting and, and as, you, as you pointed out, I think you've understated and I think Tim understated it as well. Everybody hates this guy. The people who don't like hackers don't like him because he's a hacker and the hackers don't like him because he essentially, uh, you know, he, he sort of ratted out other hackers. And of course he claims that he did that to save his children and keep them uh, in his house. And so it's it's really an interesting story. And, you know, he's uh, he's done what a lot of hackers, what Kev Kevin Mitnick and so many other hackers have done in the past. He's kind of turned to, you know, protecting people from hackers. He's, he's going to become a privacy consultant. I think he's already doing that in jail. So uh, kind of an interesting story. And really, you normally don't get to see this view of most hackers. Usually, uh, you know, of course, you never do unless they've been convicted of something. Uh, but uh, but it's really interesting, I thought. And and so the the interview is in what three parts, Lindsay? It's in three parts. The first part, he sort of talks about his history, his early days, how he got involved in in hacking. Uh, in the second part, he really gets into some detail about some of the biggest hacks he pulled off, in, including Operation Tunisia, which I don't know if you remember this during the beginning of Arab Spring, but um, Anonymous essentially shut down the Tunisian internet. And um, and he was really actively involved in that. And one of the ways that they did that was by going in through a VPN situation, a remote desktop. They actually remote desktoped into a Tunisian man's computer with his permission. And, um, and then he just got to watch these hackers from his own machine take down the internet in Tunisia, essentially. Um, in including the, I think it was the prime minister's uh, personal website. And that obviously triggered a whole bunch of action by the Tunisian government and things, you know, went from there. Yeah. So if you want to uh, read the article and also watch the videos, uh, just go to CNET and search for either Hector, H-E-C-T-O-R, or Monsegur, which is M-O-N-S-E-G-U-R. And you'll find that 
uh, that uh, that article with the embedded uh, videos. You'll f also find it probably currently on the right navigation part of the homepage of CNET.com. So check that out. It's really, uh, really an unusual uh, interview. And you know what? Tim Stevens kicked Charlie Rose's behind on this thing because Charlie Rose doesn't really know a lot about technology. And uh, he just sort of groping in the darkness to try to figure out what, what's happening. Tim Stevens does know technology. And so it's a far more interesting uh, interview, in my opinion. Uh, it's, so it's, it's definitely really detailed. And, um, you know, I know that Tim, I'm sure, wishes he could join us, but he's on a plane right now. He would tell you all about it in person. Yep. A uh, excellent. Well, everybody check it out. Sony Pictures threatened, to s threatened several media organizations yesterday against reporting on information found in documents stolen by hackers. The leaked material include emails filled with Sony executives criticizing Hollywood stars, filled with racist comments, petty bickering, all kinds of really juicy stuff. The three-page letter written by famous attorney David Boies said that Sony Pictures does not consent to your possession, review, copying, dissemination, publication, uploading, downloading, or, I, I warned you this was written by a lawyer, making use of the stolen information. It was sent to the New York Times, Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, Variety, Gawker, the LA Times, and recode. The letter said the publications would be held liable for damage resulting from the information published. The threat is probably an empty one. The First Amendment protects the press from such lawsuits. Lindsay Turntime, what do you suppose they're trying to accomplish here just to get a, get a general sort of suppression of this information? I mean, I, don't, I can't imagine that it's going to work. It's, I, it can't possibly work. I, I think that they're trying to start, I think probably they're trying to start a conversation about whether or not sharing the information is appropriate. And then you've got, you know, Aaron Sorkin coming out in defense of Sony's moves saying, really, the press shouldn't be covering this in this way. And I think, I, I'm not sure that Aaron Sorkin's the right um, spokesperson for that opinion, considering how much trouble he's been in with the public lately. But, um, but I do think that Sony's just trying to say, hey, this might not be we don't consider this ethical and trying to get people on their side because certainly um, those publications don't cover the entire press, although they're big, big name publications. And, you know, nothing, that information is out there. Somebody will report on it. Yeah, absolutely. And the ethical uh, the dimension of this, um, we've talked about this on the show before, is that when information is out there in the public eye, it's the responsibility of the media to go through it and look for newsworthy information. Now, if they're reporting information that is not newsworthy or compromises personal information for no other reason than to compromise it and to, to get sensationalism, that's one issue. But if actual uh, newsworthy information is found, it should be reported on because journalists' job is to serve their readership, not serve the interests of Sony or anything else, and if it's in the public um, uh, eye, that's the way it goes. I'd also like to point out the uh, the delicious irony of uh, Aaron Sorkin uh, talking about this, because the, one of the big themes in the recent uh, episodes of the newsroom is all about uh, information that was leaked by a Edward Snowden-like whistleblower uh, to the fictional uh, news channel, and he's clearly sympathetic to the people who are uh, public, uh, pu publicizing the information in those documents. The, the protagonists in that series, uh, send, once they get cracked down upon by the uh, FBI, they send it to what is probably a Reuters or an AP, AP reporter or something like that f for that person to leak it. And, of course, it's her responsibility to go through it, find the newsworthy stuff, and publish it. And so he's, like, he's really lionized that whole process. But now that his script is in the public eye, and, again, I'm not aware of anyone... Um, you know, leaking his Steve Jobs script uh, or, you know, sort of saying, here's the whole script. Um, that may have happened, but I haven't seen it. Certainly the, the list of publications that he, uh, that Sony Pictures is going after didn't do that. And so that's really what he, I think clearly that's really what he's honked off about is the fact that his script, the Steve Jobs movie script was leaked out there supposedly. And so, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's a, it, there is a, there is a criticism to be, to, to be brought to bear here, but the criticism isn't, uh, for talking about and reporting on any information from that leak. The criticism should be reserved for irresponsible reporting on the leaked information. Sure, uh, and a lot of that leaked information is part of, a, you know, really important conversations going on in the United States right now about our culture. I mean, we're talking about um, pay discrimination, potentially. We're talking about racist com I mean, these are really important topics. It's not like news outlets are just kind of talking about he said, she said emails about someone's weight or even that would be worth it. But 
it's this is serious stuff and deserve I agree with you deserves reporting the, and and just to, to just to uh, uh, give more detail about what you mentioned Kevin Roos uh, at uh, at one publication that was early in sifting through all this information fusion I think is the name of the publication we had him on the show uh, he jumped on the pay discrimination story which essentially they had you know there's something like uh, some number of executives at Sony that make more than a million dollars a year. And one of the lowest paid one was the one woman on that list. And she was one of the highest ranking people in Sony. And, and, and again, not compensated nearly as well as even lower ranking male executives. And so that's a story. That's a real story. That's part of a larger trend in, uh, at least in Silicon Valley, the pay of women and the, the role of women in, in, in companies and how they're treated and so on. And so that is a real story that, that to me is an example of perfectly legitimate, uh, journalism coming from these leaked documents. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll sort it all out. What's the good reporting? What's the bad reporting? But this whole thing about a blanket ban on uh, or a threat to for, for, for publications to muzzle themselves about this leaked information is not really going to happen the way they claim to want it to happen. They're just, I think they're just trying everything they can. And David Boyce is trying to earn his enormous salary. So there you go. Well, Lindsay, it looks like Xiaomi will be just like Apple if they can just copy one more thing. Yeah, so um, Ch the Chinese company Xiaomi made a regulatory filing today, and it revealed that their strategy is working, absolutely. According to Reuters and a few other publications, uh, the company has risen to the third most profitable handset maker in the world, and they have pulled in $56 million in revenue in the last year, sorry, profit in the last year. And their strategy is selling very low cost handsets, very low, like almost at the cost of making them, and then focusing on making revenue off of software and services. This seems to be working, and it's mostly in China. So this just goes to show the importance of that Chinese market. Yeah, uh, but it, it, they are profitable, which in the, in the handset market is a feat to be sure. But fifty-six million dollars is um, in the handset. I mean, the, the other two profitable handset makers, which are Apple and Samsung, report multiple billion-dollar uh, profits in each quarter, each. And so, uh, so they they are kind of this is kind of the Amazon model of. Yes, be profitable barely to plow every dollar back into competing. In four years, they become the number three handset maker in the world. Again, mostly in the Chinese market. And one of the, to me, clearly the most fascinating thing about this is the fact that uh, Xiaomi CEO Lei Jun, the guy who wore the Steve Jobs sweater and the Steve Jobs pants and said one more thing on stage when he was uh, announcing a phone, <laughs> uh, he owns nearly 78% of the company personally. And so this is really his company. It's privately held. And so this is, I think, the, the, the most interesting dimension of this story. It's a privately held company, and one person owns almost all of it, uh, more than yeah. three-quarters of and it. And he's, he's in it for the long haul. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, as part of this reporting on, on the same release, noted that Xiaomi is investing a lot of money, I think $203 million in a local appliance manufacturer in China in order to get a corner on the connected home market. Uh, so this is this is you know he's in it for the for the long term and I think has a vision of how this should play out and I think you're right it's very much a hybrid Amazon and Apple um, philosophy and I think the idea is build something that acts like Apple products that has that fit and finish and and that really uh, high end appeal and make it and then make it cheap and make all your money off of the services which is it's fascinating. Now it's also interesting and it has to be said how this information came into the public because again this is not a publicly traded company they're not required to disclose these the this stuff but uh, they actually made a, a 1.3 uh, they they bought 1.3% of an appliance maker called Medea Group and Medea Group was required by Chinese law to report certain information about the company that was investing in them and they are the ones who reported this which was picked up by the press and so on and this is really interesting because, because xiaomi is making these kinds of investments the the limited money that they do have they're plowing not only into the handset market but into the in the thing that all of the handset companies are or should be investing in which is home automation and the internet of things and so so by investing in an appliance company they're essentially hedging their bets and it's a safe bet too, because I think the the, the home automation world is going to be—it's kind of like the next smartphone market. It's a it's a world in which individual families and individual people will personally own several devices. That's the difference between the smartphone industry, where everybody has one, uh, and the home automation, where some people have many. And so it's going to be a, a probably a lucrative market. The smartphone people are in a good position 
based on their patents and their technology to play in that space. And they are hedging their bets by investing in, you know, like I said, appliance companies. So uh, very interesting story. And uh, we'll be keeping an eye on Xiaomi. They're turning out to be one of the most interesting companies coming out of China uh, for sure. Well, some Amazon warehouse employees in Germany today started a three-day strike to demand better pay and working conditions. The strike comes as the retailers are ramping up deliveries for the Christmas shopping season. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lizzie Turrentine, if they wanted a good working conditions and good pay, why do they go to work for Amazon? Well, you know, that things are different in every country. I'm kind of wondering, I mean, there's been a lot of reporting recently about Amazon in the United States and how um, it was recently decided that American Amazon warehouse workers actually can't get paid for the time they spend waiting in line to get into their jobs. I wonder if some of these issues will end up being settled outside of the country, or at least there'll be cultural movements in places where labor laws might be different to draw attention to some of, some of these hiring practices by Amazon. Just to give you a sense of the scope of this, uh, this strike, basically 2,000 workers are going to join the strike at five of Amazon's nine distribution centers. So it's a minority. There's something like 10,000 workers who normally work at Amazon. For, during the holidays, they employ some, about 19,000. The labor union that's uh, organizing this thing is called Verdi, and uh, they are the ones that are making these claims. So these numbers are coming from the labor union. They may be uh, fudged or, or not. I don't know. Uh, and uh, last year, what's interesting also is that Amazon's orders in Germany for the holiday season peaked. Well, for the whole year, actually, peaked on December 15th last year. So they, they carefully targeted the peak time for shipments of Amazon uh, for this strike. And so they're trying to uh, sort of hit them where they live and... Uh, We'll see if it causes any damage to their bottom line. Of course, Amazon is saying, hey, no problem. We're going to make all the deliveries on time uh, because we're Amazon. That's what we do. Well, just a minute. We're going to wrap it up. But first, I want to tell you about Braintree. If you've got an app and you need a payment system, of course, Braintree is the payment system to use. Why? Because they use a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, they use all kinds of different uh, and support all kinds of different payment systems, including Apple Pay. You want a quick integration of Apple Pay? Just use Braintree. They also support PayPal, Bitcoin, Venmo, all the major debit and credit cards. And it's all done with one fast and simple integration. Just put in uh, some simple code. It takes just a few minutes to integrate Braintree into your app. Their V.0 SDK is just, you know, is the, is the code and you're all set up. They literally say that it takes 10 minutes. I've heard it takes significantly less than 10 minutes, but this is what they're saying uh, for how long it takes. Super easy to do. And again, there's no reason not to do it. Uh, they also, their SDK, SDK also supports seven languages, including .NET, Java, Perl, Python, Ruby, and, you know, other major ones. They have elegant code with very clear documentation. And that, that code, by the way, is only 10 lines of code. So this is a very, very slim bit of code there. Uh, so if you're searching for the right payments platform, check out the Braintree V.0 SDK at braintreepayments.com slash twit. That's braintreepayments.com slash twit. Review their documentation, play around in their sandbox, and after you integrate Braintree, the first $50,000 in transactions are fee free. That's braintreepayments.com slash twit. Well, our TNT fan of the day is George Mitchell in Pennsylvania, who posted this picture of his MacBook Pro running TNT at work. We have that picture, Jason. Um, he's working apparently at a, it looks like a furniture store. Or are those beds? I don't know what that is. Yeah, looks like beds. Very cool. Anyway, there we are in all our glory. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of you or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we'll find it. That is the tech news today. Lindsay Turrentine, what are you guys planning for the holidays? How are you guys going to manage the holiday season this year at CNET? <laughs> uh, we are going to keep working our butts off. The Amazon uh, model. For a long time, right up until Christmas. <laughs> Fantastic. We're very busy. Yeah, I bet. I'll bet. And of course, with all the, you know, Chris, the holiday season is like, that's when all the products come out too. So you guys are trying to review them as fast as you can. So. Yeah. Well, we're, we're pretty much done with that. That cycle is pretty much okay, done. Good. And now we're collecting the very best of the year and uh, making sure that you know what won. Yeah, the e the easy one, of course, is which smartphone to buy. I'm kidding. That's the hardest one, uh, <laughs> <It's> because <terrible. laughs> you're dipping into not only technology but also religion. 
uh, yes. with, the, with the operating systems. Well, thank you so much, and we will not see you next week, right, because we have the week off next week, uh, but we'll see you the week after that right here as our co-anchor. Thanks for joining us again today, Lindsay. Thank you. All right. Well, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Yahoo. Yeah, you, you really can on Yahoo. Uh, or you can choose uh, another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. And please follow us on Twitter, Tech News Today TV, or join our Google Plus community. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today and you'll find us. Please send us your thoughts and opinions via email to TNT at twit.tv or via phone. Call us at 260-TNT-SHOW and leave a message. And don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.